Mac and Mac here with you on Birds 365. We appreciate our buddy Jeff Knox, who I thought was going camo there. He's got a different kind of sweat. I like your sartorial splendor here today, Mr. Knox. What the hell is that you're wearing? I appreciate it. This is actually six ninety nine at Walmart, so this isn't anything nice. I thought into. This hey, man. Just, just you can Walmart. get some deals. <laughs> yeah. I saw that crazy website that changes uh, charges really low prices for everything. I wish I they had a couple Super Bowl com commercials. Timu, have you guys Timu, heard about yeah. that? I've seen Timu. I've been on there trying to find me a PlayStation Five because I can't seem to find one in the stores. So yeah, I, I don't know if I trust him, but then I, I I always look at the price and I go, this can't be. This has got to be a scam. And then they're getting Super Bowl ads, and I'm I'm starting to rethink my position. But right. I'm giving them a free plug. Uh, I, I, I digress. It's good to see you, uh, Jeff. Um, I guess we'll start because we haven't talked to you. Your thoughts on on the coaching staff and the moves and and bringing in new coordinators and sort of uh, making Nick Sirianni. He was already a CEO coach, but even more uh, uh, of a step back and just overseer. I guess I would describe him as. Your thoughts on how Jeffrey uh, Laurie handled that. Uh, well, first, let me say um, happy belated Valentine's Day, you guys. Hope you enjoyed it. And congratulations on exceeding 700 episodes. So uh, I've seen most of them, but you guys get up earlier than I do. So I normally tune in at about nine o'clock. <laughs> but uh, to answer your question, um, I'm, I'm happy. I'm feeling better about this time of the year than I was last time at the same time. Um, I didn't think uh, I didn't put a whole lot of stock into or a lot of confidence into believing that the team was going to somehow get better as from a coaching standpoint. Uh, moving on from Shane Steichen and Jonathan Gannon and then replacing them with two coordinators that had never called plays at the professional level. So I was a little worried about that. Um, I've always been an experienced guy. I understand in the NFL now what we do is we tend to go with uh, the hot new guy, the offensive genius, the defensive standout, things of that nature. But um, I'm old school. Like, bring me back a, a Jim Caldwell. Bring me back a, a Ron Rivera any day. So the Vic Fangio thing I was very excited about. Um wasn't exactly sure if he's the same fan Joe remember for a few days from a few years ago. Yeah. Was, uh, I was always of the opinion if we had gotten Vic Fangio maybe three years ago, that probably would have been the Vic Fangio we wanted. Um, so recently I've been watching a lot of Miami Dolphins uh, football uh, postseason and this was in charges as well. Charges are a little bit more difficult watch, but um Kellen Moore getting the offensive court, well, actually the quarterback's coach job right out of the gate after being a player for the Dallas Cowboys and then eventually elevating to the offensive coordinator role. Uh, was satisfied there. Um, maybe not with what he did with the Chargers last year, but um, extremely excited based off of what he did with Dak Prescott, uh, actually elevating Dak Prescott to the Dak Prescott that we actually have respect for now. So hopefully he um. can same type some, of not everybody. Some, some, some people, yeah. some people, but uh, an MVP, an MVP candidate nonetheless. That's when we oh, start yeah. talking about that. So, um, 400 yards of offense first year as a coordinator. Um, over the tenure, I guess that four years that he was there, they were always in the top uh, categories as far as things that we look at as important when it comes to like statistical rankings. But um, very satisfied with the Killing Moore hire. Also very satisfied with the Vic Fangio hire. And I guess I trust both of those guys enough that when they have like uh, relationships with guys they already know, uh, I guess Doug Nuss, Doug Nussmeyer and Nussmeyer, Bob King being yeah. two of those guys, um, I trust them um, more than I trust my own ability to do it if I was in that same situation. Fair enough. Um, all right, I'm asking this question with my tongue somewhat firmly implanted in cheek because mm -hmm. got a lot of this uh, and it just makes me a little crazy. Did the Eagles make a mistake by hiring Kellen Moore? Because if he comes in and does a good job, oh, he's going to be somebody else's head coach next year. So they're back in the same exact position they were, looking for an offensive coordinator. Is that a fear for Jeff Knox that Kellen Moore is going to come in and be so good, he's going to be someone else's head coach next year? Not necessarily. I think the best – uh I think the best head coaching hires have actually gone back to their teams as coordinators. I wonder which being with the Detroit Lions. Um, I actually think that we're probably in a better situation as far as what we were last year because Brian Johnson was popping up on so many radars and uh, we were actually having conversations as, as to whether or not we lose him. I think I'm a little bit more um, uh, confident about keeping Kellen Moore. Um, he's, He's, he's a great offensive mind, but I think there are some guys who are already in the pipeline who I expected to be in the, the hiring cycle this time around. Um, 
and they actually stay in their current position. So we'll see. But um, I also subscribe to the theory that get the best coaches available. He's probably the best offensive mind we could have had. Correct. So the best thing to do in that situation is we'll worry about those things later, but championship windows close very quickly. And I'd rather have the guy that could actually be head coach material as opposed to the guy that we're stuck with because we know he isn't going anywhere. Right. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm with Jody there. You can't worry about that. I mean, that's just the nature of the modern NFL. I mean, the Eagles were runner ups and they lost their coordinators. So, you, you, you know, and, and San Francisco, well, Kyle Shanahan scapegoated Steve Wilkes, but they also lost Anthony Lynn. They lost Clint Kubiak. They lost, Daryl Tapp and X Eagle, they lost somebody else. They've already lost five coaches, one by by their own. So that just kind of happens with success, right. whether you're good or not. So then you got to make difficult decisions and you're back, but that's just sort of the modern NFL. Uh Hassan Reddick, Jeff, uh interesting situation. Wanted to make it clear, hey, I didn't ask for a trade, but the Eagles uh gave him permission um to seek out a trade basically doing what they did with Darius Slade last year, which is like, look, if you think we're being unfair talking about numbers and extensions, go talk to other teams, see what they're willing. And if you get what you want, we'll try to work something out. You like that strategy from the Eagles or dislike it? Um, I like it. Um, and seems like Hassan Reddick seems to be in favor of the way they've treated him as well. Um, I'm sure if he was, he's, he's vocal enough and expressive enough that if he had some issues with the way they were handling him, he probably would have said that. But, um, I think this is also feeds into the reasons why he wants to remain with his team and stay with the organization. Uh, I'm in favor of it. Um, same thing they would did with Fletcher Cox and Darius Slay, uh, Fletcher Cox on previous season and Darius Slay last year. So, um, I, I would be in favor of it. Um, my my guesstimation, and John, you probably know more about this than me, is Hassan has already made it clear that he wants a contract. We knew when we signed him for three years and uh, 15 million per season that he had he did we had already gotten him at a discount. So now he's outplayed that contract. And um, you have a guy who's going to turn 30 before the season, um, with the Eagles needing to make other decisions. Landon Dickerson down the road. What are we going to do with that about Dallas Goddard? We can put the uh, fifth year option on Devontae Smith, but eventually we got to pay him. And you're getting some younger guys who are at the end of their deals. And I don't know, maybe we want to keep Josh Sweat around longer because he's younger. So um, I get it. Um, I'm sure that as we, we've we been throwing that $25 million per season number around, I'm sure the Eagles probably don't want to pay him that. But this allows Hassan to get out in the market and everything. If he has been turning deals or the Eagles have offered him down, that allows him to get out in the market. Um, talk to some people and realize, you know, the Eagles are doing right by me. You know, they're they're actually telling me something that, you know, that isn't unfair. And it's for those reasons that I think that um I'm I'm thinking maybe he finds something in the uh in in while he's out here exploring his options and things of that nature. But there is also a situation where he could return, which is what I'm hoping for. Um maybe a couple of years, a couple more years where he's productive. But I like the move by Philadelphia. It seems like it was a fair move and it seems like he understands the the situation that this is a business and their reasons for doing what they did. When Howie and uh, Nick had their uh, wrap up the season, Nick's staying, but other guys are going press conference. Uh, our buddy, Tim McManus asked the question. All right. So then what are you going to be doing? And uh, may show up at a defensive meeting. Uh, he is as CEO, a CEO coach can be. There's one of the things he may have to deal with. If Reddit goes out and finds a team that's willing to get upwards of that $25 million mark, but the Eagles are only offered a fourth round draft pick in return, how he be in the valuation guy that he is, is not going to get a, he's not going to do it just to get Reddick moved along. He's going to hold tight as to what he thinks he deserves in uh, return in a trade. If you got Hassan Reddick back on the team under contract, knowing he's blatantly underpaid and the Eagles, acknowledging that because he went out and got a deal that would pay him more, but they won't trade him because they're not getting enough back. The guy who's going to have to, who's going to have to handle that and, and try and smooth things out is Nick Sirianni. That, that is like the, the biggest job a CEO coach can have is keeping players who might not be a hundred percent happy, at least happy enough that they're uh, productive when Sundays roll around. You think Sirianni's fit for that role? Um, I think he is. Um, 
I was among the people who were kind of worried about whether or not Nick Sirianni had lost the team and um, listening to some comments from the way the, the veterans have defended him, the way A.J. Brown has defended him, the way he seems to fall on the sword for the organization and his team. He's won the respect of them. Um, I'm, I'm among that crowd, too, where I hope it, it doesn't necessarily get to that point because uh, we've. We know how Sean Reddick's the ultimate professional, the consummate professional. He's going to go out and he's going to do the right thing when it comes to game days. But um, this is also the guy that decided he wanted to give the defensive coordinator the silent treatment. <laughs> so I don't know if we want to ruffle those feathers too much. Um, Hassan, I'm, um, I've had the pleasure of talking with during the season last year. A uh, great guy, very mature guy. And so I have a slanted view of him anyway. But um, he, he's one of those guys I want to stay around because I don't see how this team – um, is in a position to where we can move on from our best players uh, while we still have that championship window open. So I'd like to see him back, but to answer your question, um, if there's one thing that we know about Nick Sirianni, that is, the personality of him is probably one of his most endearing features. And um, his, the love his team has for him is also one of the things that are probably one of his best assets. So he's absolutely the person that could probably smooth that over, but hopefully it doesn't get to that situation. Yeah, you mentioned, and, and I'll throw this at both of you guys because I'm interested to hear your thoughts because, you know, we all try to figure out what went wrong and everybody's got their own thought process, offense, defense, this, play calling, that. But when you, you mentioned some of the players depended Nick Sirianni, Jeff, and they all have basically to a man. And he heard a bunch of guys that, that were out at the Super Bowl, Fletch among them, Britton Covey was among them, Jordan Mailata, um, on and on and on. Obviously, Jason Kelsey you know, on his own podcast uh, was doing the rounds. And nobody seems to be able to put their finger on what went wrong. Does that bother you guys at all? Because if you can't figure out what went wrong, how are you going to fix it? I, I don't know. I, I'm trying... And I, I brought up Andy Reid, yet because he he texted Antonio Pierce after the Raiders gave the Chiefs a little bit of a, a, a beatdown late in the season. And he texted Antonio to thank him for giving us sort of a, a, a course correction, beat us up. And he mentioned the word complacency. Is it as simple as they were complacent and they, they had such a great run? And they said, ah, we'll be fine. Because... I, nobody can figure out what went wrong. Um, well, we can't. Um, my hope is that they know that in the organization. And I think that was the main thing that we were most frustrated and most concerned about because it looked like the organization had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> um, they didn't seem to have any answers. We thought that the the stripping the side of play calling duties and handing those over to Matt Patricia was a sign of desperation. And uh, we found out later that, you know, there was some issues with the side and there was issues with his his ability to connect with teammates. Um, now we knew that getting the play calling duties over to Matt Patricia wasn't going to cure that or make this a better defense, but as long as they have the, the, the answers in the organization, which is what we were concerned about, do they know what they have in Nick Sirianni? Uh, we've asked questions. Do they know what they have in Jalen Hurts? As long as they got it under control un and under wraps in the organization, I'm fine. Sometimes we'll get those stories eventually. Maybe it's a month down the road. Maybe it's years down the road. Sometimes we don't. But uh, what I don't want to become is having our Eagles organization, which we fell in love with for keeping things so close to the best. Um, I like when we find about signings and their surprises. I like when they keep things close to the best. What I don't want to become is the Dallas Cowboys a few years ago where everything was public <laughs> and everything was for public consumption uh, because – it seems like now they've buttoned things up a little bit more, and then we get with the guys with the leaks and the, uh, the 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 anonymous sources and things of that nature. So um, I, I'm being long winded, but to answer your question, if they got it figured out in the organization, I'm fine. And sometimes, the less we know, better. But you know, John, you are not here for the story. So <laughs> if there are leaks and they get some information to us, we'll enjoy that well, so we can uh, have those conversations as well. Here's, here's one of my take, because 92 things went wrong, and we can point to all <laughs> of them, break them down one by one. But if you're looking for the top ones, yeah, it's on the defensive side. Um, and this is kind of on Nick. If he saw, and uh, Jeff just alluded to the fact that Hassan Reddick wasn't talking to Sean Desai, and that uh, there were others that didn't think the size message was getting across 
and Sirianni must have realized that. That's your job as a head coach. Mm -hmm. You got to coach up your coach and you got to coach up your players. If your players aren't working well with the coordinator, then get your players in your office and go, listen, I told you he's in charge. And what I, what he says goes, I'm telling you what he says. You need to hear it from me. I'm the head coach. All right. I'm telling you what he says goes. He let that rift become a thing on the team. Now, he also told you that by pushing Desai up into the press box, he thought it was more on Desai than the players. Okay, that's the direction he chose to go radical and strip him of all his power. That didn't really work. So, yeah, that's kind of on Nick for me. If there was dissension amongst the ranks on the defensive side of the ball, just because you've got a coordinator in place, there's a guy above him on the flow chart, that's the head coach. And I don't think Sirianni handled it well. So if you're looking for somebody to point the accusing finger at on the defensive side, yeah, I'm putting it on the head coach. Fair statement. Fair statement. I will yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and look, I said from the start that that was a disastrous decision. I mean, I, I, I mean and, you know, Sean Desai, for all the hits he took, um, he looked only better after they made the decision yeah, because true. somehow they got worse against lesser competition. Mm -hmm. Um, if that's humanly possible. So, and and Matt Patricia, that's a difficult situation for Matt Patricia as well to come in in that standpoint. One thing I know, I'm not in love with this scheme. I think I talk about it all the time. I think people have caught up to it in the league. But if you're going to run the scheme and the Eagles are hell-bent on running the scheme, this is the guy, Vic Fangio, that you want running the scheme. So they should be better prepared. They should be taught. They should understand their roles better. Um, and there should be incremental improvement from that standpoint yet. But bottom line is, and you can look at any single coach in the history of football, most recently Bill Belichick, Andy Reid, his last year in Philadelphia. Um, everybody has bad seasons. Bick as a defensive coach has had bad seasons. He's had bad defenses. It's about personnel first. The Eagles got to fix a lot of personnel issues on the defensive side. Right. Where do you start? What's the biggest thing they need to add defensively? Uh, let's get a young edge rusher. I don't think Julian Aquara is that guy, but a young edge rusher. And for the time being, I think the priority number one is making sure Hassan Reddick is happy. Like this team is not a team that's in a position to where we with, um, I mentioned championship windows earlier. There was a time when I actually thought the Legion of Boom was going to get two or three. And that didn't seem to work. Should have had two. Should have <laughs> had two. Yeah. They were a yard away from two. Yeah. So I thought they were going to – these championship windows close very quickly in the NFL, and now you got the Green Bay Packers who have all of a sudden come out of nowhere, and they seem to have added to the the muddle that's you know, is now the NFC. But um, this team now – and I got I heard you guys talking about power rankings later on and this team being the middle of the pack team now. Like, are we ready to challenge Detroit right now in this current situation? Are we, are we better than the San Francisco 49ers? Probably not. Um, the Dallas Cowboys are the Dallas Cowboys. They'll be around. But um, goal number one – it's getting your best players, um, getting them situated and getting them happy. And I believe that includes Hassan Reddick. Like, I'd rather have him on his team because I just don't see a situation where our pro bowler walks away and his defense becomes better when we were already having issues getting to the quarterback. Now, he did, he may not have a lot of time left, but um, maybe um, we got to, we got to have him ready. We got to have some, uh, some guys in the pipeline ready, one of which probably being Nolan Smith, get him in the gym because he's a little light in the tail feathers. But um, curing this pass rush, um, finally paying some attention to the, the safety position, finally paying attention to the linebacker position. Because with uh, Bobby King here, I'm not moving away from the theory that maybe Zach Cunningham's back after we've heard Howie Roseman give him a glowing review. But um, one of the ways to do that, maybe this helps, is uh, kind of moving on from Kevin Byard. That would save you, what was that, $13 million, I believe. Yeah, some 14 somewhere he's in that 14, right here. I think he's due 14 million next year. Yeah. I think by moving on from him, he counts as 711,000 against the in dead cap space. So, yeah, that frees yeah. up a lot of money there. Um, so Vic um, might want him, but he will not be back on that contract. No right, chance. Uh, no, yeah. They'll have to rework a deal and maybe wants him because he's a veteran guy, he's savvy, and all that kind of stuff. And they need help, but he ain't coming back under that contract. 
We know that. Yeah. So let, let me ask you a similar question to Kevin Byard. I think we all agree. Could be here, going to be redone. How about James Bradbury? He took as big a drop from where he played the year before to what he played at this year. Maybe as any player in the National Football League. That's hard to wrap your head around, but we'll have Brad Spielberger on afterwards, Mr. Pro Football Focus. I'm guaranteeing he's going to tell us his drop-off was monumental. He sure as hell isn't worth the contract that he's going to be playing under next year, much like Hassan Reddick is worth more than the contract that he's scheduled to play under. What do you do with Bradbury? Do you just grin and bear it and say, we're only one year in. If we tell this guy we might cut him, does he say, yeah, go ahead, take that dead cap hit that you're going to take if you cut me one year into this deal? Would he be open to um, potentially redoing his deal so as to give the Eagles a little relief off the overpayment that they made this year? How he's not afraid to play hardball when it comes to negotiation. Ask Hassan Reddick. Um, will they do that with James Bradbury, or do they just believe he can't be as bad as he was this past year? Well, I'm across the fingers because I've seen from James Bradbury moments where one bad season is typically followed by a better one. <laughs> so That's true. You know, oh, okay. That's, that's true. true. I like your optimistic I attitude, it. Mr. Knox. <laughs> Glass half full. Good on you. Right. I doubt it. I doubt it. But uh, let's hope that happens. But James Bradbury, we mentioned uh, Hassan Reddick being a consummate professional. I think that was uh, one of the things I saw in James Bradbury's personality, too. Don't know him. Never had a conversation with him. But um, one of the things I've always admired him, whether that be in Carolina or with the New York Giants, was just um, the manner in which he killed him, carries himself. He carried himself as a professional. And um, it was the Eagles that threw him a bone when nobody else seemed to be interested. And we yeah. get that which allowed him the opportunity to uh, put himself in a position to earn this money that we thought would probably be elsewhere. But um, as it turns out, decided to stay uh, with his new home, the Philadelphia Eagles. I hope that plays into his thinking when um, it's time to make these types of decisions, because, um, you know, this is a, this is a give and take business. And one thing about James Bradbury and the, the rest of his team is this is a locker room full of characters who have a lot of character. So, um, I'm hoping that that also kicks in with his thinking as well, because um, this is a team that really gave him a shot when a lot of people sat there and said, this is the guy that can't do it anymore. And um, yeah, and, and, and you know what? Big's going to be a big part of that as well mm -hmm. it, on, on, on what he feels about these players. But I'll say this, I, I a lot of people have kind of turned the page on Bradbury. Well, you got to move on from one of the, the two better quarterbacks. You can't move on from Slay because of his contract. So you move on from Bradbury and you take, if you designate it post June 1st, I think it's four and a half million dead cap, no salary cap relief, but you're not losing salary cap as well. So you can do it. But one thing I'll say, people kind of forget, go back to training camp. They're playing them in the slot. We're all like, what are you doing? What are you, what, what, what are you talking about Sean Desai? Mm -hmm. Um, and then Slay gets hurt with the knee injury. They're moving him to the left side. They're moving him all over the place. Yeah. The Eagles didn't help him. Um, maybe Vic just sits him back. One of the best zone corners in football. One of the savviest zone corners in football. Playing quarters all the time. Cover six in, in that defense. Maybe he does have a bounce back season. And yeah. you can afford to wait another year with Kaylee Ringo and Eli Ricks, and maybe they develop. So I think people are turning the page a little bit too quickly on James Bradbury. So I'm glad you said that, Jeff. Um, and we'll see. I think it all has to do with Vic thinks of him as a player. But you mentioned power rankings. I meant to bring this up. Mm -hmm. So let's get Eagles fans fired up. The 33rd team, first one I saw, probably other people have done it, but 3013. I, I rolled the athletic out there for you yesterday, John. You're on the show. Well, no, I'm not talking about team power rankings. 3013 oh, okay. did quarterback power rankings. And the 2024 offseason quarterback power rankings. Where do you think they put Jalen Hurts? I ask you both. I got a feeling the way these things always seem to work out. I think you're going to probably tell me he's 15th. 15th? <laughs> Jody, you got a guess? This is how I always see where it goes. I'll go slightly better. I'm going well, not more than more than slightly. Um, tenth, tenth. 
So, so we got a 10, we got a 15. Drum roll, please. 17th. Wow. 17th. <laughs> That's how badly things went down the stretch for Jalen Hurts and the Philadelphia Eagles. Now, I, I'm with you guys. I think that's unfair. I don't think there's 16 better quarterbacks than Jalen Hurts in the NFL. But, boy, this league moves quickly. Um, and if Jalen doesn't start getting going back in the right direction, and you mentioned Jeff Doug Nussmeyer before, he's going to be the quarterback coach. He might be the most important positional hire on this team because he's the guy who's going to be working with Jalen Hurts day to day. Um, any concern? I think everyone's like, well, Jalen will get better. Any concern it's going to keep going in the wrong direction? No, and I'm actually looking at the list, John. So we got uh, Joe Burrow, Jordan Love, uh, Kyler Mary, Geno Smith, uh, Kirk Cousins. All these guys are ahead of Jalen Hurts. <laughs> so, Geno, they got Geno Smith there. Geno Smith, Jared Goff, yeah. uh, Trent, uh, 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 not Trent, <laughs> Richardson. I'm, I'm having a mind. Anthony Richardson. Uh, he's, Anthony he's Richardson. Yeah. They have Brock Purdy at 18, Jalen at 17. Uh, two is 19. Yeah, it's it's a crazy list, but I just threw it out there uh, because I was shocked at how low Jalen Hurts was. It gets, um, us, it gets us talking. So just based off the list alone, and I love the 33rd team. Let me say that. Let me say this. I love the 33rd team, but uh, – Hold on. I, 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 Jeff, I I got, I got, hold on. Players. Jeff, I got to interrupt you. Domowicz's name isn't attached to that, is it? No. Uh, no. 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 <laughs> no. Because if he, he's a dead man walking tomorrow, if that's the case, <laughs> he's on our show tomorrow. No, and if he's not, involved in that, uh, it's not I mean, his fault. It's not. Tomorrow. It's not his fault. All right. Yeah. All right. Sorry to interrupt you. No, I, you're you're fine. fine. And uh, I love C.J. Stroud, but C.J. Stroud is not a better quarterback right now than Jalen Hurts right now. Man, so, I uh, might disagree with that one. I love yep. C.J. Stroud, but love, Trevor love, Lawrence is a look. I love Trevor Lawrence coming out. Tremendous talent, but he hasn't lived up to his hype to this point. He doesn't. He's too high. I think Joe Burrow's too low. I have no problem with Jordan Love. I think he's going to be a star. Maybe they went, uh, they started a little bit quickly on him. Yeah. Um, some of the other guys, like Richardson, played what four games? I mean, yeah, that's, on. that's just ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, Richardson's got amazing talent. Um. But to be ahead of Jalen Hurts after four games, I, I, yeah, I, I, come on. But anyway, I just wanted to throw it out there. And I look, I look at you guys like my big brother. So sometimes I have a tendency to ramble. And Jody, you know this, so <laughs> always reel me back in. But to answer your question, John, no, I have no concerns about Jalen Hurts. Uh, it was commenting on the list, but I have no concerns about Jalen Hurts. So uh, the one thing we know about him is his work ethic, and that was one of the reasons why I think the first time I came on and talked to you guys, I was like, that's why I wasn't worried about him when we were asking about the uh, 52% completion percentage and things of that nature. Like, I like my quarterbacks to be grown-ups. I like my quarterbacks to be team guys. Maybe he needs to be more vocal. Maybe that's what the Eagles want to see from him. But if we know anything else, Jalen's going to be the first guy to the building and the last guy to leave. And um, maybe it was as simple as replacing him with a um, – replacing Brian Johnson with Dave, Doug Nesmeyer. He's he's a coach's son. He needs to be coach hard. And there's a possibility that, you know, just having a, a friend of the family um, in a in a uh, position of um, I guess leadership in his organization, I guess that probably wasn't the best thing for him. And um, we can get into play calling and things of that nature, lack of motion, all those other things and stuff. But the uh, the addition of that with Kellen Moore um, taking this team that was a team that was thirty second in pre snap motion <laughs> out of thirty two teams and giving him some some just some ability to just be able to look at a defense and see a guy mo travel with the receiver in motion and know this team is in man now as opposed to zone. Just little things like that will help out. But, I, again, being long-winded, but I have no issues with Jalen Hurts. And um, this is a guy after the Buffalo game, we were still talking about him as an MVP candidate. That guy's yeah. still there somewhere. Yeah, he was the leader on, on in the – yeah, it's amazing <laughs> how quickly. Sites, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've, I'm on record with this, Jeff, and I'm kind of a lone wolf here. Uh, you know, I'm with you on the, it was just, it turned out to be a bad idea. Not, I, I didn't sniff it out ahead of time and go, Hey, wait a minute. You know, Brian Johnson and he in a new relationship might not work. 
Uh, if I did, I'd be taking uh, victory laps. I didn't. I, I, I thought that was positive, honestly. So, yeah, was, uh, most people did, uh, that it was a, a good hire and, and it was uh, the relationship was only going to get better. I'm with you. I think it went backwards and it didn't fit. That's why they've moved on from it. But I've said this basically since the end of the season. I think they gave Jalen Hurts too much power this year. I think they put too much on his plate. I think he was making the decision on run pass, on not only the RPOs, but on an almost every down basis. And he wasn't all that good at it. That he wasn't great at seeing the perplexity of the defense and taking a guess and what are they trying to hide and what are they going to drop into and the like. And I just think he misguessed. And they had some bad play calls that were Jalen's at the line of scrimmage. If I'm right, which I don't know that I am, and I'll readily admit I, I'm out there kind of by myself on this one. If they change this year with Kellen Moore, will it get better? Do you think Kellen Moore will give him the same kind of latitude to make all those calls as they come up to the line of scrimmage? Or do you think it'll be more regimented and Jalen will be told, listen, run what's called? You know, you actually talk about your argument. I'm sitting here listening to you, and I'm like, uh, they probably did put too much on his plate. I agree with you on that in that stance. Um I, I think it will improve, but this is the NFL, and I know a lot of times we get into recency bias, which is why we went from Jalen Hurts being an MVP candidate <laughs> uh, almost more than halfway yeah. through the season. To, to all two, of two is not I better than play. Anthony Richardson, yeah, in yeah. So, record um, time. Right. Ineffective happens in the NFL. Um, you, you have Tom Brady is the best to ever do it as far as I'm concerned. I saw Peyton Manning have long stretches during games of ineffectivity. Like, that's just what happens in the league. Like, there are times where the defense wins. There are times where it's just like it takes the offense just a long time to get traction. And it also happens when you're calling screen passes on um, on plays where the defense isn't blitzing. Because <laughs> basic football, I was always taught you throw the screen pass to – I don't know why I'm throwing up fireworks. <laughs> wow. Look at that. That's well done. Screen passes on non-third that. downs. Like yeah. the fireworks. Yeah. Everybody agrees. I don't know where that came from. I apologize, but I I'm impressed. I don't I, yeah, you should if you figure it out, you should do it more often. <laughs> <laughs> but uh hey, we Jim gotta get some of that working behind yeah. us. Hey, well, oh she yeah. does fireworks. Yeah, it never yeah. happens with McMullen and McDonald. What the hell? I gotta yeah. figure that out now. <laughs> That's gonna be yeah. I gotta yeah. figure that out. It looks like a birthday text is what it looked like to me. I don't know how to yeah. do that either. On my birthday, which was a couple of weeks ago, I got a bunch of texts with fireworks go off in the background. I gotta learn that too. Right, right. So you got like a lot of coaches who have uh, coached football for a lot longer than Jalen Hurts has been playing it. And these guys are the guys on the other sideline when he takes the field. He's 25 years old. We sometimes forget that, too, because he is so yeah. mature, because he is uh, well a very young quarterback. Yep. He has a um, lot to learn. He has a lot to learn about being a leader. He has a lot to learn about um, this, the way the NFL game is played. He has a lot to learn about just playing the quarterback position in general. He's 25. He'll figure it out. But uh, he's a lot further advanced at 25 years old than I was when I was at 25 years old. <laughs> so I believe in Jalen Hurts to that degree. Um, I think this works out. I think this is just – he just got so good during that MVP season in 2023 that we just expected that was going to always be the ceiling and Jalen Hurts was no longer going to have any adversity. But adversity has come. Um, we've seen him deal with adversity before. And this has been said over and over again. I know this is probably a tired narrative now, but we saw adversity at uh, Alabama. We saw him leave. We saw everything that happened with Tua Tunga Valoa. We saw the doubt. We saw him um, outlive the doubt. And now this is just another stage in the growth process. The thing is, it's just we've all had to grow up. We've all had to learn about our positions. Like, John, you're a much more advanced writer than I am, and I've always been a fan, so it's always been an honor to call you as a friend. But I'm still learning how to write, and I'm, I'm an old man now. <laughs> so there are things I'm learning about my position, and I'm sure that becomes doubly impossible when it's uh, when you're talking about something as, as, uh, as uh, scheme-focused as the NFL. Um, but Jalen Hurts is good. He, Jalen Hurts was figured out, and Jalen Hurts will grow up and grow up in his offense. We're just having the benefit of watching him grow up on television. Uh, inside the Eagles.com, I G G L E S. That's where you can read. Uh, Jeff does a tremendous job there. Follow him on X. You, you can do the site, uh, Twitter, which is at Inside Eagles. Uh, Jeff, uh, if you want to follow him personally, at GQ underscore four underscore EBA, E-B-A. So follow him there. Um, I guess I'll end it with DeAndre Swift uh, for this 
and, and give our next guest, Brad Spielberger, a little. He does a tremendous job projecting contracts. So I'm going to look at his projection for DeAndre Swift. And he's got DeAndre at three years, $6.25 million per year, $12 million guaranteed. Any shot he's back with the build up Eagles if that's the contract he gets. And I see you laughing. So I, I think Not I event right. number no. <laughs> we wouldn't get that to TJ Edwards. I doubt we're gonna get that to a red event. So <laughs> <laughs> you know it's funny. We were talking about the betting sites with Jalen Hurts. I got a, I got a betting site that says the Eagles are the favorite to get Saquon Barkley and one of the favorites to get down. Are you kidding me? I've never I've never seen the Saquon Barkley argument. It's like that's like with me. I, I've never seen the argument that we're taking the defensive back in the first round. Like until I see it happen. When was the last time? Lito Shepard, <laughs> two thousand two. Until I see a, a, a defensive back taken in the in the well, first they round. will yeah. take a cornerback if it if it fits. They would have taken J C Horn. That's true. Uh, they would have taken Patrick sauce. Sertan. Sauce of sauce would have um, yeah. So it's always there. There are certain positions like you can feel very comfortable. They're not going to take a running back in the first round. You can feel very comfortable. They're not going to take an off ball linebacker. Even there's exceptions. Christian McCaffrey, I talk about mm -hmm. all the time. They would have taken him in yeah. 2017 and they would have been right, but uh, didn't work out. Um, it's, it's possible and it's doable. I'm just in a position where it's like, I doubt it's going to happen. And I'm, I'm more doubtful that we'll give that type of money to a running back. <laughs> All right, since uh, J Mac went to uh, running back with Swift, and I like I like your chuckling halfway through all, the question. We all looked above. Yeah. Uh, for sorry, Brad, that's not happening. He's not getting that from the Eagles. I don't think he's getting that from anybody. But uh, we sure as heck know if that's his his pay scale for next year, he's not going to be in Eagle Green. Who sure. will be the e leading Eagle ball carrier next year? Will it be a to be drafted player? Or will it be Kenny Gainwell? Yeah. Or will they bring in a free agent for DeAndre Swift like money? Make a trade. When I say bring in a free agent, they could trade one for a fifth, sixth round draft pick, whatever, pick up somebody else, like they did with Swift. Is he is the Eagles leading rusher next year on another team in the NFL right now coming in either via trade free agency? Is it Kenny Gainwell's role being pumped up? Or is their lead running going to be runner going to be taken in this year's draft? A, B, or C? Um, I guess I'll take A M. He's he's not here. We'll say that. <laughs> um, it can't don't be think it's going to be Kenny Gainwell. It can't be Kenny Gainwell, and I like Kenny Gainwell more than most. Um, I think he gets a bad rap sometimes, and um, I I just think he's better at his job than people give him credit for. He's not excellent. He's not even DeAndre Swift, but he's definitely not as bad as some people say he is. But um. He, that, that, that to answer your question, Jody, that guy's not on the team yet. Um, Laguerre and Blunt coming in in 2017. Uh, I think Josh Adams, uh, Corey Clement were both undrafted. It's just, it's just a position where you can make the most impact the most quickly because you have a little bit more license to freelance from time to time. But and it's uh it's also the most punished position in the NFL and they have the shorter shelf life. So um, I understand the reason, even though some people disagree with this, I understand the reason why the stock has gone down in that position so much. Uh, but the guy's not here yet. Um, because we know it's not Boston Scott, and we don't even know if yeah. the is gonna be here. The old TBD, I agree with that. It's yeah. TBD. I think they'd love to get an Isaiah Pacheco type late in the draft who could take over. But that's I love that. Uh, yeah. I actually thought that guy was Kenny Gainwell <laughs> in the fifth round. Yeah, yeah. yeah unfortunately, that slightly that there are 30 other teams with I know. an Isaiah Pacheco-like player in the seventh round. Yeah, it's easier said than done. He'll be alone in that picture. Everyone yeah. else looking for the same exact thing. But they are that. not signing Saquon Barkley. They are no. not signing Josh <laughs> Jacobs. No. I, I think people need to, come on, be realistic. Um, yeah, 6.25. And I think DeAndre might get that. Very similar to what Miles Sanders got last year. Um, but he ain't getting it here. Yeah, he won't um, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Um, I I don't think he's even getting that, and we we all agree he's not getting that here. What we got was some good insight from our buddy Jeff Knox. Always a pleasure, my friend. Yeah, I'll be getting over getting you on the, over on WIP with me coming up soon enough. Thank you for jumping in with us today, bud. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. It's always fun. Appreciate you having me. 
Our Thanks, pleasure. Jeff. Jeff Knock inside the Eagles fan site inside inside the Eagles I G G L E S dot com. All right, McDonald McMullen coming back. Maybe we'll continue the running back conversation. I just uh, John John went there first. I followed up. Um, I know they're not getting Saquon Barkley. I know they're not paying with DeAndre Swift. If Brad Spielberger is right, and we'll get Spielberger up in less than twenty minutes from now and say, you think he's really going to get that much? Um, who the hell is going to run the ball for the Eagles? And here's the 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 whole TBD of it, as John just stated. What I think means nothing. What John thinks means nothing. What Jeff Knox thinks means nothing. What Nick Sirianni thinks doesn't mean a whole hell of a lot. It's going to come down to Howie Roseman and Kellen Moore. That's who's going to decide who's going to carry the football for the Eagles next year. So that's why we have no I'm gonna, idea. I'm, uh, I'm going to throw a name at you, free agency wise, that I, I wouldn't mind. You want me to do it before or after? The yeah, break? let's get it. Let's get a quick break in here, and then we'll come back and do that. Talk a little bit more about the Eagles and their running game. McMullen and McDonald here on Birds Three Sixty Five. Birds fans, here's your chance to save up to forty, up to forty percent on your car insurance. You can do it right now. From one of Jacob Sports' great partners, here's what you need to do. Call managing partner, either Jim or Fran, and tell them you're a friend of Jacob Sports and also Birds 365. Hi, I'm Jim Neilbronner, managing partner at DelVal Insurance Group. Give us a call. We're a local, knowledgeable agency, not an 800 number. Go Birds! 